Great. Well, welcome to all of you. It's nice that we have a mix of PhD completion, still busy, and some MA students as well. I think that's quite a, quite a nice mix to have in this session on um, life after postgraduate studies. Before I introduce the, the panelists, um, I do, do just want to say as well, for those who've come late to the early career and postgrad party, the previous workshops that we've had uh, were recorded and podcasts are available on the ESOCSI website under the ECPG network. So if you are interested, we've had some really interesting sessions on becoming an academic writer, which journal and why, the importance of public scholarship, cross-disciplinary work in a PBRF era, academic labor, academic lives, and uh, last month we had the oral defense, and then of course today's session on um, career trajectories. And one of the main reasons for having a session on life after postgraduate studies, or even the afterlife of postgraduate studies, is that of course we, we're all, we all know that very few people start their postgraduate journey with a very clear plan in mind of what they want to do when they grow up. And, you know, for many of us, university is this fantastic little hideaway that we can be in um, and, and not confront the, the, the so-called real world. And who knows, many of us are, might still be hiding here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the reality for many of us is that at some point, the need to earn becomes a bit more of a powerful motivator than um, the, the desire to learn. And of course, I recognize that a lot of learning happens on the job when we get there. Um, for some graduates, you're presented with opportunities along the way, and the degree then becomes a means to a particular end. Other people have had years in the labor force, and they come back to postgraduate studies um, with specific employment related um, reasons, for specific employment related reasons. But I think more and more as I see um, postgraduate students moving through, many others are facing that daunting what next question. And then of course we have that uh, pesky elephant in the room in the form of the changing nature of work. And I think many university graduates will experience periods of precarious labor um, or perhaps even a lifetime of insecure contract work. And I don't mean just doing odd bits of work to put food on the table, um, but many people are doing work that they're well qualified to do and indeed very passionate about doing. And gone are the days of the 30 year um, career with one employer or in the same line of work. But of course, it doesn't really mean that we've got to throw up our hands and stop postgraduate study and, and, and let out a big sigh. This is a global 21st century reality. And this is why we're here today to discuss um, how we can use what we've learned to make a difference in the world and to explore some of the very circuitous journeys that a social science postgraduate qualification may take us on. So it's really against that, this backdrop that we wanted to have a session like this and we've invited some lovely people along to discuss their journeys and to have a look at what they've done with their postgraduate qualifications. Um, I, I wanted to get a sense from them about, you know, how, have they, if, if at all, have they used the content of their postgraduate studies in their work or has it been a means to many varied ends and, in, and indeed sort of unintended ends um, as you would have seen on the flyer, all our panelists this morning are University of Otago alumni, so welcome to, to all of them. Um, and all of them have had very interesting, less than linear career pathways, which I, I hope they will talk about today. So without any further ado, if I could introduce, um, I, I, I might just go sort of down, down the line like this. So sitting Next to me, we have Dr. Nave Valt, who is currently at the Higher Education Development Center here at the University of Otago. Nave has a PhD in geography. Um, in fact, I recently co-edited a book with Nave on global resource scarcity. That was a very exciting, um, we're, we're glad it's done, let me just say that. <laughs> Nave has also done a lot of work on food politics um, and is currently working at HEDC on um, pedagogical as well as political aspects of higher education. 
next to Nave, we've got Dr. Crystal Phillip, who is at the Dunedin City Council, where she's team leader of urban design. Um, Crystal's done some fantastic work in, in Dunedin that we're all very exciting about, including the development of the warehouse precinct. Thank you very much. <laughs> so a lot of the exciting development we see around Dunedin is, is largely due to, to Crystal's insights. Uh, and Crystal's got a lot of extensive experience um, in, in the public and, and private sectors. And if I didn't mention it before, sorry, uh, Crystal's also got a PhD in geography. Next to Crystal, we have uh, Rebecca Barnes-Clark, who is currently at the Ministry of Defence. I met Rebecca in 2014 when she was at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And um, she's worked for a number of ministries since then. Uh, Rebecca has an honours degree in politics. Uh, also a degree in, in commerce um, and is currently principal analyst at the Ministry of Defence and as I said has worked at a number of ministries including Treasury, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade um, and has recently been seconded as senior advisor to the Honourable Todd McClay. And then at the end of the lineup, we have Dr. Vivian Anderson, also at the Higher Education Development Center here at the University of Otago. Vivian has a PhD in education and has, a very, has had a very interesting journey all around the world. <laughs> um, you know, partly, for, as she says, following her partner um, across the world as he was doing um, postdoc stints and then pursued her own PhD studies in education and anthropology. Viv's also worked as a teacher um, before now working as a researcher in higher education. So a very warm welcome to all our panelists. Um, I think if we, if we just sort of begin sort of reflecting on why you started this PhD journey in, in the first place, um, and, you know, we don't have to go question by question for each panelist, but just some thoughts, maybe we'll start off with you, Nave. Um, why, why did you pursue postgraduate studies and where has that taken you? Um, well, uh, hello everybody. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question because I, I started university, I started a BA at the relatively old age of 25. Um, and quite quickly I realized that doing papers, it's not really my thing. It was a bit boring. Uh, my peers were quite younger and it, I never got excited about it really. So I knew that I wanted to do postgrad and uh, at a higher level and engage more fully with some of the things that I was interested in. Um, but I didn't know that I would end up with a PhD. That was uh, something that just you know, came about almost. Um, and almost for personal reasons, like my partner was, uh, she did a, a long studies in universities and I kind of you know, had time if you like. Um, so I just carried on um, and found it very, very interesting um, yeah, and finished uh, with, with a PhD and almost unintentionally. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there anyone who's intentionally followed a PhD <laughs> for specific reasons? Are you all still hiding? Are we hiding? <laughs> Are we not facing reality? <laughs> Um, I mean, I think it's also, if, if I can turn to, to Rebecca, I mean, we sort of, uh, you know, many of us are on that PhD journey or been there, um, but you've had a particularly interesting career, um, uh, having done a, a BA honours um, in, in politics. So, yeah. Um, so for, for me, um, the, the BA honours was relatively easy. Really interested in the subject matter. Loved my department. Just the department, just so you know. Um, love my department. Um, so that was a, that was quite a straightforward decision to do that. Um, but uh, uh, the interesting point for me came when it was time to decide whether or not to do a Masters of International Studies or to finish my economics degree. And so the juncture I took, um, as compared to everyone else around the table, was instead of doing a Masters, I decided to broaden my skill set out and have um, have the degree in economics as, alongside the um, alongside the the BA honours degree. Which, um, interestingly enough, um, I started off the university wanting to work at foreign affairs and trade, um, like everyone who does international politics. Um, then switched halfway through and decided, no, no, I wanted to be an English teacher. 
and wear a rainbow poncho and teach English, <laughs> Macbeth particularly. And then halfway through, I swapped again because I wasn't doing as well in English as I was. Um, and uh, then by the end of it, made that decision to flip to economics and actually ended up with a graduate job at the Treasury. So interestingly enough, after all that wafting around rainbow poncho English teacher side, almost came full circle right round and got a job in, um, in doing economics in that sort of role. Um, so that was quite, I was just grateful that someone wanted to employ me, <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm honest. <laughs> 12 years ago and there was a funny job market, very, very tight labour market and um, I was just pleased someone wanted to offer me a job. So that's how I ended up where I was. Um, and also um, my parents were like, Treasury, that's a good place to work. And I was like, okay, that sounds good. But yeah, but you know what I mean? Like it wasn't, it wasn't a, a sort of um, a conscious decision. It was sort of a bit more of a, sorry, I'm, w I'm wiggling that sort of yeah. <laughs> general shuffling towards that outcome rather than a conscious trajectory. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and I think that that is the reality for most of us. It's not, it's not something you plan. It's it's mm. almost accidental. Um, just sort of checking in the room if, if or on the screen if there's anybody else who wants to chip in at this point about their intentions or maybe lack thereof that have ended them up in a PhD. <laughs> all, all good. Okay. Um, yeah, Chris, I was just kind of interested as well in in um, in, in your journey mm. uh, into the DCC, where where you currently do some really interesting. Work. Yeah, so in some ways, um, <clears throat> I'm obviously not from here, if you can tell by my accent. So I'm from the states, but I've been in Dunedin about six years, and um, I started out in architecture at a young age, um, and slowly, um, well, not not so slowly, actually pretty quickly fell in love with cities and urban design and realized um, the importance of that aspect and looking at cities um, as quality places for people um, to spend time, um, not just in buildings, but in the spaces in between buildings. Um, and so where I am now, um, in some funny way, is sort of exactly the job that I was aiming for at that early age. Um, but you know, like some of my peers here, actually, the journey was quite waffly getting there, and I didn't necessarily expect that I would get there so soon, um, or in a city that I love so much. So I feel very fortunate. Um, but the so for postgraduate study, I had um, I have two master's degrees from the University of, of Notre Dame in the states, which I was corrected when I first went there. I called it Notre Dame, um, and <laughs> you can't do that in Indiana. You have to say Notre Dame, which is really um, Spoken. <laughs> but anyway, I went there and I got a master's in architecture and a master's in urban design. Um, and that was very much like a conscious um, choice. I liked how they were training students. Um, their programs were very well suited to what I wanted to do. Um, and um, you need a master's in architecture at a credit university if you're going to practice in an, in an architecture firm. Um, and at that point, that was still kind of an option for me. Um, but then I fell in love with an Australian and moved to Melbourne. And um, long story short, we fell in love with Dunedin and moved here. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and the PhD just sort of happened for me as well. It wasn't something I necessarily needed in my career path to, um, to get to the job that I'm at now. Um, but we came to the city and I didn't know what I was gonna do at first professionally, but I knew that I wanted to be here. And my husband got a job at the university and um, I met two um, supervisors here that were just perfectly suited to what I wanted to do. It felt a little bit faded um, and they wanted to work with me. So um, that's how the PhD sort of got started. And it was, it felt faded in some ways, but it was a rough journey getting the, um, getting the uh, um, scholarship because I, uh, I came from a little bit more of a practitioner background and um, and I didn't have the publication record and that kind of thing. So it was a little bit rough getting, getting going, but then um, once I got going, it, 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 was, it was awesome and it gave me that time. So it wasn't something that I needed for my career um, trajectory, but it was something I needed personally um, to have that time to explore the ideas in depth that I wouldn't get in an office environment. And that's meant a lot to me um, moving forward because I feel very grounded in what I believe and, and what I don't believe. Yeah, and those skills of yeah, transferred into my job really well, so.
I want to just pick up on, on a couple of things that uh, Crystal has said there um, and then bring Viv into the conversation. You, you mentioned that the, the PhD was not really needed for, for the job that you're actually doing. Um, and, and Viv, you're now obviously based um, in, a, in a senior lecturer capacity at a university where the job, where the one of the requirements of the job is having a PhD. So I wonder if you just want to talk about that, the, the idea of, um, you know, the, the need to have a PhD or not um, um, in, in your yeah. area. So in terms of my own path. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a bit like Nave. I didn't really um, have any great career in tension. When I started a PhD, I was a teacher and we just moved cities for my husband's third postdoc. Um, and I was kind of sick of teaching small children while having small children at home. So it was a bit changing <laughs> for a change. So, so I sort of embarked on one postgrad paper, which became another postgrad paper, which became another two postgrad papers. And then I got a fantastic scholarship and I was just so lucky. So for me, the PhD was just kind of a job to do instead of a teaching job for three years. And that's kind of as far as I thought. Um, so where was I going with that? So I didn't need a PhD to go back to teaching. I wasn't sure if I wanted to go back to teaching or not, but I didn't, hadn't really thought through any other options. So there was really no planning whatsoever, actually, which is startling when I think about it. <laughs> um, I mean, I was lucky because someone else was paying the bills in my house, and I, I really recognise that. That's not the case for everybody. So I was really lucky. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and then suddenly I thought, oh heck, I've really overqualified myself for teaching and no one in primary has a PhD. Some people in secondary do, but it's unusual. Mm. Um, so what do I do now? And, and I kind of had a panic at the end of the PhD <laughs> and it kind of comes fast. <laughs> um, and I applied for, do you want me to keep going? Yeah, yeah I applied yeah. for a couple of jobs and didn't get them. Um, got in on a kind of contract research project that was done by an NGO and was really seriously underfunded. So it was a very frustrating kind of thing to be in on because it was kind of shoddily done research. <laughs> but I got the job of writing it up and could say that I'd, I was an AI on a grant, right? So actually it was worth something. And so I guess looking back for me, odd dead ends have actually been not, not dead ends at all. Mm. And then a job came up in the Otago Daily Times. I was going to say ODT, but most of you aren't from Dunedin. <laughs> and, um, and it was for a, um, what, I can't remember the name of the title of the job, but it was a research fellow position in the dental school, would you believe? <laughs> and um, I kind of looked and thought, oh, it's an academic job, and wh whipped on and then thought, hang on, it's 0.6. And I had three small children at this point, and so I knew I didn't really want to be full-time. But kind of thought maybe I wanted to think about work where I could do research because I really enjoyed it. So that was kind of where I was thinking. And I thought, oh, well, I might as well apply. And I got it. So then I was in the dental school, New Zealand's only dental school, for three years thinking I've got myself in a total dead end. But again, not at all a dead end. So ended up moving from there, but I won't go on. So, yeah. so not needed for what I was doing, but ended up being really important for what I ended up doing. Yeah. So, but without much design. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, can I just check at this point? Is does anybody in the room want to comment, or you have any questions for the panelists? Richard, was that a oh, no? <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Is that Sorry. okay? Yep. Okay. Are these questions for us too, or are these yeah? The questions are for everybody. I mean, you can direct them to a specific person, or you can throw it out to. Um, I'll probably address the panel. So the question I have is just this idea of if you apply for a job and kind of back to your original question is that if an employer doesn't really care about the content of your PhD, but what are they looking for in regards to the skills that you've acquired with a PhD? Like what is so enticing about having a PhD that an employer would want? Do you know what I mean? Is that like a clear question? Like, even if it's not the content, because I would love to know in regards to, yeah. Can I just chip in on that question? Because one of the questions I was thinking of raising was, I have a, some, something of a fear of going to people who do, to job applications that don't require a PhD, admitting I've spent three years in a, in a university <laughs> environment, and, and, and how, how to kind of address that. Yeah. Can, I, can I jump in from a government perspective? Um, <clears throat> and sorry, personally, I can't talk from the PhD that length of time. But um, in terms of government, depending on what you're looking for, mm -hmm. it really is 
how you think and how you evidence how you think and how you reason through things and how you um, you chop up a problem, um, the kind of ideas that you bring. Um, uh, because, I mean, uh, in all the jobs that I've worked at, so I'll just use Treasury as an example because it was a graduate program. Um, there was a doctor, uh, PhD, so Dr. Dr. Craig, um, he had a PhD in religion. There is someone there that has a master's in singing. Like this is, and I'm, I'm not, I'm actually like with the, the, the master's bit was the, she did write a research thing, but her degree was in, was music and it was singing. So, um, I mean, if you were interested in working for the government, it really is, it, it is how you think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, you do, in some of the jobs, you do need a little bit of that, um, that subject matter expertise, but there's a guy in my team that has a PhD. Okay, so I'm in defense, he has a PhD in some sort of, Astrophysics. I don't. I can't. I don't understand it. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a simple. I'm a simple English lover. Um, uh, but uh, uh, don't don't be frightened. And particularly for government, um, people would say uh, a PhD means that you um, you can you've stick ability. So, and focus, and you can get something done. You can do a big research project. Your writing will be funny for government, but that's okay because we <laughs> we can fix that. Um, <laughs> but um, people people wouldn't people pay, don't don't be frightened of it. Yeah. Be really proud of what you've done, and um, you know, um, people people look on it really really positively. Yeah. Um, I would agree with that completely. Yeah. So, working in local government um, as well, like that exactly. That, that quality of thinking, that stickability, that critical yeah. thought, that um, ability to think through a problem on a deep level and get to a solution um, mm -hmm. in a way that maybe some of your, your um, colleagues mm -hmm. may not quite have those same skills. Um, I would also say uh, if you go for a job interview and you feel scared to bring up your PhD or to talk with your potential employer about it, then it's probably the wrong job. Um, or probably the wrong person to work for because I've had some pretty bad experiences going to interviews at um, private firms and I've had people tell me oh well what good is that going to do me that was a waste of three years you know because it wasn't a like, um, practitioner experience mm. um, or I've had people say you know that's really interesting but you've been out of the game for a while so um, you know, I, that would take, that would be a kind of a risk for our firm to take you on. Um, but I did have a local practitioner um, architecture firm that was thinking about taking me on before I got the job at, D at Dunedin City Council. And um, he was a really good man. And he, and I went into the interview starting to mask my PhD and show him my portfolio work from before the PhD. And he launched into, he's like, I want to hear about your PhD. <laughs> and he's become a good sort of um, colleague in the field now, um, even though I'm not working for him, he's a good person. And he wanted to um, use all of my skill sets if I were to work for him. And then um, with my current job, I feel like the um, skills have come in really handy and were well respected from the job interview onward. Um, that she's right about the, the writing thing though you do kind of have to learn a different yeah. writing style but um but that's just you know any job you're gonna have <laughs> Chop those yeah. off, Chop it yeah. 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 they like their bullet points and their yeah. numbers and, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh but yeah i would say don't don't sort of hide it don't be ashamed of it be proud of it yeah. and own it yeah thank you thanks richard yeah um rebecca um and, and crystal actually um you from what you said, I just wonder if you think having a PhD perhaps gives you a little extra license to apply for work that's outside your area of expertise. Um, you know, that some of the people's qualifications that you mentioned um, of your colleagues um, are quite, it sounds like they've kind of made quite um, sort of um, kind of left field kind of moves, you know, from say religion to the treasury and so on. So do you think um, for people like that, they going in with a PhD, um, perhaps even if they are, if is outside the area of expertise, it gives them a little extra, yeah, permission perhaps to do that? Or do you think perhaps not? I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about permission unless you, yeah. you are writing your PhD on something that you particularly love so much that you want to work in that area. Mm. But central, for central government, I mean, like I say, I work in defence and I have a background in IR, but I know next to nothing about frigates. 
<laughs> this is one of my portfolios, maritime security. It's mm. because I can it's because I can think and I can structure an argument and I can and I've had experience in government, for example. I just I just if if you want to job and apply for whatever tickle you fancy. Mm. I mean, I I wouldn't um, yeah, I wouldn't worry about sticking in, sticking in your lane here, team, especially with, um, I'm going to get on my little bandwagon here, especially with social science degrees, because especially in government, and I'm going to shut up after this and let other people speak, but um, uh, especially in government, pe people do everything. And so understanding how people work, how they think, what they do, and having some experience in that is really, really important. Mm. Um, and there are things at university that I learned, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which we all love in commerce. <laughs> Um, that I, I came out of it and I was like, oh, thank God, I'm never going to have to use Maslow ever again. I use Maslow quite a lot because it's how people, it's how people work and understanding that is really, really important. But seriously, guys, don't feel like you have to stick to your lanes if there's something I can really, really, really um, don't. Can I just kind of jump in? I, I totally want this session to be positive. <laughs> but I, have, I, I think we can learn quite a lot with our own and from others kind of failures, if you like. So, so let let me share with you some of my failures. You know, I'm not ashamed of them. I applied for lots of jobs at government, didn't even get a single interview. Some of them were specific jobs, um, and some of them were kind of general graduate recruitment. Always got this kind of dry email that doesn't say anything. That oh, we sorry, we had lots of applicants and. You weren't you know successful so I would say having a PhD seems to me from my personal experience and from being in higher education we also have some visit some people who research those things come and talk to us it is a problem all right so I'm sorry to bring it out to you it is a problem in New Zealand um, I even had some chats with HR people in Wellington that work for ministries they struggle to understand, they don't really understand what kind of skill set PhD graduates can bring. So it's true, I, I completely agree that you can apply for jobs outside of your area, area of expertise because you have uh, skill sets that are trans transferable. But people who do not have PhD sometimes and employers might be feel threatening by it, I don't know. There are different reasons, but it's not that easy and you may be, you may come across as overqualified, even though you may not feel overqualified. If I can add to that, I think um, maybe there's, there's something to be learned from a combination of what both of them have said, that um, maybe it's, it's not necessarily um, the, exactly what you researched or how you researched it, but it's kind of, for me, the, the PhD was quite a personal journey um, and it grounded me in who I am. And it gave me a certain level of humility because you learn how much um, you don't know, like they always say. And, um, and also how much work and energy goes into just answering one tiny little question. So you come out of it um, with, with quite a bit of humility, but also groundedness for me anyway, and what I believe in my field and what I, what I think is rubbish and, and ideologies that I'm not going to buy into anymore. Um, and so I think for me in the interview, becoming the person that I am um, was, um, the PhD played a big role in that and the person that I am is the person that they hired. Um, so I don't know that it, it, even though the PhD itself might cause some tall poppy syndrome reactions or people may not understand it, if, you, if you're the right fit for the job in terms of personality, which a lot of times it does come down to, um, then- um, You need to get to the interview for that. Yeah. That's true, you do need to get to the interview, yeah. yeah. Which is the first barrier and it's a, for me, for my experience, it's a yeah. big barrier. Yeah. So I don't get it to the interview. Yeah. Even though I got some professional help with CV, I toned down a lot of things. They took out publications, left only key publications, so it doesn't look too intimidating. So I agree with you, yeah. but you need to get to the interview stage yeah. to, show, to show yourself. Yeah, that's tricky, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so can I just make a comment? Um, so I'm now in a position where I'm involved in hiring people and both in short-term research roles and in permanent academic positions. And um, I totally agree, Crystal, actually. I think um, I agree with you, Nave. It's a tough world at the moment in academia as everywhere. Um, but 
positions, it is the person in the position. Mm. And and someone said about do you, you know is the PhD crucial kind of thing. Um, in academia, obviously it is. You won't get an academic position now without a PhD, or very rarely, um, except for maybe in some professional fields. But um, but still, the person is critical. So you know we've had people apply for positions who have this incredible publishing record. Um, but are clearly not a fit for our department and they haven't got through. So so I really agree. I think it's a whole, you need to think whole and um, not get too fixated on this PhD. And I also agree with Rebecca, Rebecca sorry, Rebecca's <laughs> comment about not sticking to your lane. So in my case, so there's two things. Um, if you're super flexible and you can travel anywhere and take any kind of Position anywhere in the world that fits your specific field of interest and are available and you get a look in, you're lucky enough to get a look in, well, great, that's fantastic. But in my case, I had a husband who'd finally got a permanent academic position, so I couldn't just up and off and I wasn't, I didn't want to. And um, so I had to be really, think quite laterally. So this job came up and I realised actually they're looking for someone with education, they're looking for someone who can do research, they're looking for someone who can teach. And so actually I'm a fit. It's such a weird, total different world to anything I've ever done, but I fit the skill set. So I really agree. Just be very aware of the broad skills that you have and don't be afraid to apply for stuff that might seem left field. Yeah. <laughs> and look for mentors who can kind of help you with that because crafting the application is difficult um, yeah. and takes some skill as well <clears throat> because you need to really elucidate how you have those skills and how your experience is relevant. Don't expect the panel to read between the lines because they won't. They're reading too many applications nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the other thing, get mentoring around this. Yeah, yeah but I, I do acknowledge that it's, you know, there's no sort of formula here for a neat career path either. It's, a lot of it is also serendipity. Yes. Thanks. I'm just seeing Yvonne's comment, but I can't see, uh, um, maybe that's why I needed the laptop. <laughs> Thanks, Yvonne. We're, we're just getting your um, comment. Uh, but, you know, I think just, just to deepen that point that the panellists have made, there seems to be a kind of the you in your CV versus the you in person. And, um, and I think this sorts of, this, there seems to be a question here about how do you get a potential employer to see beyond the CV? So... Yeah. If maybe if the panelists can, can speak to the question of how um, how to find avenues to to expose yourself. Well, that's a terrible expression given <laughs> the context of everything that's going on in the world. Um, to present yourself <laughs> in, in a way that's not just your CV. So opportunities to for a potential employer to to see you in person. Um, so in, in the case of like not getting to the job interview, but still being able to to see the people so that can see you outside of your CV? Probably, I'll just speak briefly because I feel like I've been speaking a lot as well, but um, a couple things played a big role for me in that. Um, and I think part of that was the, um, the cover letter that you write. Um, that's a real art to write those. And the, um, and the references you get, those can pull a big weight. Um, also for me, um, an important part of the PhD journey was all of the stuff I did that wasn't related to the PhD necessarily directly. So I did a lot of teaching on the side in subjects that weren't necessarily mine, for example, social geography, um, that wasn't my, but I, I learned a lot from teaching it. Um, and, I, and I did some design work on the side sort of as a, um, as a sole trader to keep my design skills alive on the side. And through that, I ended up networking a lot with the local community. And so and it's not a typical trajectory, but um, in some ways the PhD was, a period of three or four years in which I had opportunity and flexibility to network with a lot of people and in New Zealand that's really important um, which I find a little bit frustrating coming from America because it does it does mean a lot of um, it, your job does um, have a lot of relationship with who you know and who trusts you and who tells their friends and their colleagues that they trust you and so I think even before I got to the interview um, there were certain people that knew me and had whispered about me and um, luckily some of that was good enough that it got, <laughs> you know, it could go the other way. Um, so um, it's also kind of being aware of, of people's perceptions of you and not getting too caught up in that, but um, being aware that that does play into it. And if there's an opportunity for networking um, and for making those, those social connections so that people 
almost learn to trust you by um, who else trusts you, if that makes any sense. That I think that actually plays a bigger role than than anyone wants to probably give credit to. Yeah, and can I just add to that? In, in the academic world, really small, apparent, dead-end, kind of short-term, fixed-term, little research, shoddy jobs, just do the best work you can because mm. word of mouth is so powerful. Yeah. A, you're learning skills. B, you're showing that you have skills. C, you're showing that you're a, hopefully a good departmental citizen. And little things lead to other little things which lead to slightly bigger things which lead to bigger things. And they're all, if you want to go down the academic route, ideally they also provide opportunities to publish, um, which is just mm. such a gift. So really really take those little supposedly dead-end frustrating crappy jobs and do them the best you can would be my advice as well yeah and look for them if you're looking for that kind of work tell people because it's amazing how often we sort of have you know suddenly someone might have five thousand dollars and they don't want to go through a whole employment process and they don't have to for a casual staff member for that little wee job but we know someone's just finished their phd they're brilliant at x i need that and then there's an opportunity so tell people if you're looking for that kind of work can I just also second the, the networking side of things? So, I mean, my advice for getting a job um, would actually be do everything you possibly can to find, and again, this, sorry, this is Wellington, a departmental uh, ministry based, everything you can to try and talk to an actual person in that department, whether it's HR, whether it's a hiring manager, whether it's someone you know, cousins, cousins, neighbor and it's New Zealand so there will be someone's cousin's neighbor we all know that um, I mean me for God's sake here I am um, you could say I was at your I was at the panel you spoke at. Mm. I'm always happy to have a coffee but in terms of Wellington it, it's it's so important um, I've bounced around within the government and several jobs and every single one of those is because I know someone that I've either worked with or that I've made the point of getting to know and finding out about the job and then you walk in or they see your CV and they're like, hey, I'm going to pick on Richard. I know that guy. I had a coffee with him last week. That's right. You know, and you've made that, you've made that contact. Um, so I just, I, I, I can't, I can't re-emphasize that, that enough, particularly, particularly for Wellington. Um, I, I want to add that I'm really glad that I wasn't the person who brought up this. Thank you. I think New Zealanders have, um, as you can hear my accent, you know, I'm also a, an immigrant in New Zealand, so I have some insights, if you like. Um, Kiwis like to believe that the world is fair, and New Zealand is a fair place, and everybody has a fair crack. Well, I think you can get a notion here that it's not necessarily the case, and who you know uh, matter a lot. So yes, the things you've done, your CV, your achievements are also important. You're not going to get a job, I would like to hope, without those. Um, but in order to get a, a you know, a, 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 some advantage, it's, it's really good to network and know people and, and to have uh, referees that actually are known or known to the, to the prospective employers. Um, yeah, perhaps not the first thing, but that's reality. But you make it, you make it happen yourself. Like I, I made it happen with Treasury. I got in contact with, I remember I was in, um, uh, was it Archway? Cool. Archway and we the Treasury gave a presentation and I went up to it afterwards. Hi Christy, I'm Rebecca. I'm really interested in working at Treasury. Um, can you can you tell me a bit more about it? Is it all right if I this is cheeky? Is it all right if I email you my cover letter? I'm I'm cheeky. Can you tell me? And she kindly emailed me back and said, Oh, don't call it civil servants, call it the public sector. Just a couple of little bits and pieces. I didn't know her from Adam. I'm I mean yeah, if you if you don't if you don't put yourself out there, it's not going to happen. And if you put yourself out there, it's not always going to happen. But you know, you have to you have to take that chance. Um, so I agree with that completely. Um, and it's just I guess it's recognizing that it's part of the game. It's it's yeah. not my favorite part of the game. I'm naturally a very shy person, actually. So putting myself out there and networking um, takes a lot of energy for me, and it's not natural. Um, but I realized how important it was early on, and I and so I, I made it happen. Um, so it's just it's it's another one of the skill sets that you need to be aware of and 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 prioritize. And I want I, I want to pick up. <laughs> I want you know on a more positive note, I want to pick up something that Steve said, <laughs> is that yes, seize opportunities, um, 
And I'm also kind of, an, may not come across as, a, as like that, but I'm quite a shy person, actually. Um, wow. And <laughs> uh, <trust me. laughs> um, so I don't, I don't, I'm not really good at networking, just approaching people. But I always, when I get an opportunity, I try to do my best and go beyond, you know, what's expected. So my current position, I have been working as a researcher in higher education for over two years now. But actually, it started as a part-time gig for, for three months. And the only reason I'm still there is that, you know, I managed to impress the boss. So, um, so attitudes as, you know, it's not in my job description, or don't have really place in my view, not in academia, probably not in government as well. You want to impress your boss, you go beyond what's expected and you make yourself invaluable. And then it might be, you know, it could have some kind of future. Yeah, I agree with that. I'll just add quickly, I'm in a position to hire people now as well and um, hired someone about six months ago as an urban designer on my team and the job description, you know, has to do with drawing plans and preparing um, parts of reports and this kind of stuff. Um, and I threw at him randomly um, uh, a lot of jobs associated with um, events planning and um, I felt really really bad about it but he just we needed to do it as a team and in, in terms of engaging with the public and he just picked it up and ran with it and didn't complain and did a really brilliant job um, and that actually means a lot to me and makes me want to keep him on as much as I can because I know he's willing to kind of be flexible and 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 work with me whatever we need to do because it's not always a straightforward kind of job yeah, and that is so powerful. So, um, and I think that applies to academia as well. There's kind of can-do people who just yeah. get on and do a job, and then there are people who just are really drag the tip, drag the heels, or grizzle, or complain about the conditions of their work, which I understand. You know, when you're in a precarious job, I understand that. But I have to say, if you if you're interested in the academic route, you have to go into kind of fixed term things, being really um, fully mindful of the complexity of the funding environment. So I've heard people um, complain, for example, about their work conditions when they're on a grant and why can't I be promoted or why can't I be given more money? But you need to understand that if someone gets that grant, that's the money there is. So you, if you agree to do it, do it well. If you don't agree to do it, don't agree mm -hmm. to do it. Don't complain because you won't get recommended. And it, the reality is the money is limited. So it's kind of, it's tricky. You know, we need to be aware of our employment rights. Um, we need to be careful that we're not exploited. But at the same time, if you are can do, word will get out. You'll get given other opportunities. And even if they're not exactly what you want, it's amazing how often they lead somewhere. Yeah. yeah. There's just a question here for me, Bond. Do you want me yeah. To yeah. So this is Yvonne says, being able to articulate your skills and strengths are key to employment in any job. Self-awareness is key. Offering a rational and logical reason why you're applying for the job and what you bring to the role is important, not just being able to do it. Yvonne works in our careers centre. Yeah. So thank you. Yvonne. Thanks <laughs> for that comment, Yvonne. I'm sorry for the delay. We just couldn't um, have it up on the screen for, for a bit. So we had a technological glitch, but thanks for that contribution. Tracy? Uh, yeah, um, Crystal, you raised about having a strong reference list. And I'm just curious, like, who did you use on your reference list? Like, um, you know, we're doing a PhD, obviously, you have your supervisors. So would that be a, a given? Um, and then I'm thinking now with even um, just going through the oral examination, you know, can you, can you, and nominate one of your examiners and so who, who do you pick and and and, and how do you play that um, sort of the best card for me it's the um, yeah combination of sort of thinking about that network and not who knows who as well as who really knows you and can and speak honestly and, and well to who you are and and how well you can work um, and also some demonstration that you someone who works in the line of work that you're trying to work in who can um, sort of vouch for you that yeah it's a, it's a decent bit kind of thing so for me I had um, one of my PhD supervisors um, but I also had someone in the uh, two people from the industry actually in two different countries um, and then someone locally as well um, so I had the two people from the industry to try and convince um, the council that I wasn't stuck in La La Land in, from the PhD, um, but that I actually had these other skills and um, a lot of practical experience behind that. Um, I had the PhD supervisor because she's the one that I had worked most closely with over the past um, few years and could speak to my strengths here. And then I had the local connection um, to kind of give them some idea of my local commitment and my um, 
and my interest in, in this city. So I guess it, it kind of depends on what you're applying for, but um, I guess it, think about who they're looking for and then who can best speak to that. So you might even adjust who you put down in your reference list depending on what kind of job you're going oh, to Definitely, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. person that you always have, because yeah. I know you well, but yeah. then tweak it. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. always tell them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ask them, yeah. Ask them yeah. yeah. That's a good <laughs> calling a referee and they go, I mean, for, for example, and I can't say that it's successful because I have yet to be successful in that, but <laughs> what kind of I strategize around it if I have if I apply for an academic position elsewhere, I'm trying to also to have uh, as a referee someone from, or well, people from different universities that know me and I know them. Um, and then if I'm applying for a non-academic job, I try to have a referee that is non-academic and can vouch for other aspects of, of, of me as a, as a worker. Yes, yeah, so definitely try to strategize around who your referees are. And if, and if you think that the employer might know one of them, that's a big, big bonus. I just think for some people it might be hard if you have been, you know, immersed in a PhD for three years and all the work you've done has only been with, you know, research assistant works, so everybody is your recent um, references are from academia, then you know, how, how do you get that connection? Because some, because people sort of do need to know you intimately, how you do work. Um, I mean, I think one, one sort of possible thing is um, following an academic route, one of the things we often suggest to students is you know, put yourself out there at conferences. So go to conferences, meet people, walk up to those people who've just done a presentation. And the next time you have either, you know, whether it's a, a, a draft of an article, send that to somebody you met at a conference saying, would you mind looking at this? I'm thinking of sending it to this journal. But then what you've sort of also done, you get some comments, but you've also put your name mm -hmm. in, in their mind space and they, um, they would have then read your work. So they, they have an mm -hmm. idea of what you work on. Um, and you know, later on, they might contact you as a potential reviewer for somebody else's article. And, and it's, so it is, it's just that sort of networking and, and not being, um, you know, even, even for shy people, just to, you know, to make the, the human contact. And I think that's the thing that sort of come out of this discussion for me is not letting your CV speak for itself. I mean, so often we sort of hear, oh, that's a great thing to put on your CV. And it's all about the CV building um, and, and very little attention paid to the human relationships building. And I think that that is becoming more and more important, um, particularly as, as Viv was alluding to, um, in, in a world where, you know, there's one job and you have 60 applicants, you know, you're, it, it's very easy for, for your um, CV, as great as it may be, to just get a little bit lost in that pile. So making that connection where somebody remembers your name, I think is quite key. Um, I just wanted to add to something that Phil was saying about not being shy to not being afraid to do the the grunt work um, and to do it well. Um, and, and I don't want to turn this into an, an all about me session, but but I, I've had a you know similar sort of trajectory where I came from a, a permanent um, job, full time job in South Africa, and I moved to New Zealand for personal reasons. With with a um, I was on somebody else's research grant, so it was a, a point two job for one year with no further prospects and um, you know having having made that significant move from South Africa to to New Zealand with, with no job prospect after one year, I mean everyone did think I was actually quite mad um, and and in some ways it was quite a quite a mad decision to to do that um, but I did a lot of grunt work and and through that I met Nave because of the, the book project we worked on. I had no idea about natural resources, but I've edited a book on it, <laughs> thanks to Nave. <laughs> and, and at that same opportunity, I met um, Rebecca. So it's just these sorts of things that you, the opportunities, what seems like a dead end, as many people are saying, is that question of how can you turn the dead end into an open door? Mm -hmm. um, and while I was in this one year contract, the job came up, I knew I wasn't actually the best person for that job because they were looking for an environmental sociologist which I am not, despite how I try to spin my cover letter. <laughs> um, and I knew I wasn't the best person for the job, and I didn't get that job. Um, but when the HOD came to tell me that I, did, I wasn't shortlisted, he, he said the, the best thing about that was that other people have now seen your CV. 
So it was in a context where people knew me in person, but they hadn't seen my CV, and, and then I was able to sort of stitch those two ends together. So, so I think it's both those things, the CV and the, the in-person yeah. Yeah. contacts. Can I just add another comment too? Um, you're not just a student, so I'm sure each of you have other lives, like wider lives, and it's important to think also about how they can feed into your career pathway. So, and that might be volunteer work that you do or community work you're involved in, or um, in my case, a professional background in Christmas case as well. So um, just be really mindful of that whole package when you are thinking about work and when you're applying for work. Mm -hmm. And again, be careful to articulate what skills and what understandings and experience and track record you can show because of that whole package. Yeah. And I'd say if you're applying for an academic job, it doesn't matter too much if your all your references are academics. My, my husband's mm -hmm. a solid academic and not much else. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, professionally, professionally. <laughs> he's not much more than that. He's <laughs> wonderful man, but professionally he's, he's, he's very much in the, it's the academic world. Um, that's worked out very well for him. He's, he loves it and he's happy, but all of his, all of his references have always been academics, but it makes sense if he's strictly kind of in that realm. So I don't think that's a problem if you're applying for academic jobs. Yeah. We had a question from Kieran. Yeah, it's a comment and a related question. So I was interested when talking about can-do attitudes and being competitive and throwing yourself into things, and interested how that was brought up in the context of, of antagonizing workers' rights. <laughs> and that that is uh, increasingly uh, seems to be a, the, the place of rights is, is quite a precarious is in a precarious position. Whether it's uh, thinking about how many people died for the eight-hour working day for instance, and like we're in an academic environment where that seems to be like a, a pipe dream and a nostalgic reference to times gone by already. And it's absolutely fascinating to think of that in terms of, um, I guess, kind of retaining agency and integrity while also trying to be competitive in, in the employment market. Um, so that was, a, that was a comment and kind of a related question, um, related perhaps to some of or five of your stories that you've shared, is have you had experiences where you've chosen geographical place before you've chosen work and in academic academia it seems to be that you have to be globally uh, fluid um, if you want to present yourself as being competitive can i respond to that so when i was doing my phd in the last year i went to an academic careers kind of seminar and it was the whole panel talked about how you have to work 24 7 for seven years um, if you're not prepared to move or you don't have a PhD from somewhere else from where you're applying, you're a dead end. I just about got off and walked out because I had three babies, a husband who was, had just got a job, you know, and it was just like, that's not me. Okay, I might as well give up now. Um, so I, my point earlier is if you can't move in terms of the academic pathway, then you have to be prepared to think laterally. So in yeah. terms of what is available here, that might not be in my subject area or right in my particular area of interest. So I think there is a degree at which you have to be flexible in some way, um, but it's not necessarily a dead end. And yes, I chose place first, I couldn't move. So I'd agree with that. Day. The flexibility can be about how you move, where you move, but it could also be how you decide to stay in a place and, and, and change your roles within it. And, I chose to need before I knew what I was going to do here. So. And the comment about um, sort of exploitation, I just want to comment on that as well. So as a young, as a young, I wasn't that young, actually, as a, as a graduate. Go for it. Go for it. Desperate. I'm so desperate. I'm so desperate. I started my postgraduate at 30 with a baby puke down my front. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so there is a way in which sometimes you get asked to do things and they're kind of cast as opportunities. And they may be opportunities, but you have to be careful. So there is a, while I say, take opportunities and do them with a can-do attitude, also be quite careful about what you say yes to. So for example, if someone asks you to teach, um, and it's not just a one-off guest lecture, you should be paid for that work, and it's okay to ask about it. Um, if someone's asking you to do research, you should be paid for your hours. But you also probably need to recognise that if you want to be first author on something, that may require hours beyond the paid hours of the research work. So there's kind of, it's always kind of a balance. Um, what am I prepared to get up here to get this work done in this publication or this opportunity? 
um, what is not okay in terms of me giving time for nothing. So be careful. And I would say early on, I think it's really important to take opportunities if you can. Mm. Um, but as you go on, you can be a little bit more careful mm. about what you say yes to. And sometimes it's good to get advice before you say yes. So it's okay to mm. say, can I get back to you on that? Um, and I'll give an example. I was given lots of opportunities to collaborate with very senior staff members who then kind of dumped me with the work mm. and vanished. <laughs> and it really was work that was not my field. So really hard for me to publish because I'm having to explore, you know, literature that's so foreign to me. But if I want to get anything out of this time I've put in, that's what I'm going to have to do. So I learned to be quite strategic about who I did and did not agree to collaborate with once I had enough of my own kind of track record. But early on, I just said yes, 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 and it worked out okay. So yeah, just that's what I'm meaning about sort of exploitation versus mm -hmm. opportunity. But, but I think also for those of you who are master students or, or still in the PhD, um, and it's something I tell PhD in our departments quite often, and they consistently ignore me, is that you need to show up for a, for events, show up for seminars, show up for different uh, workshops and so on in your in your own department, because that that's the main way in which people who are not your supervisor will get to know you. So if you're doing a degree in distance, that's that's a problem. But if you are physically uh, present in your department, you need to make yourself visible, because that would that might create some opportunities. Yeah, I agree that goes a long way and especially it seems like an obvious thing 10 years ago but now with the digital age and lectures being pre-recorded and being able to collaborate um, virtually it's it's rare to see people who just physically show up and are there and that actually goes a long way um, like Bob I said so take that opportunity to, to get that interpersonal um, time with with your colleagues um, and attend those conferences, go to the random events and, and get to know people. And it's not just about being strategic work-wise, actually. It's also about you, you find amazing mentors that you don't mm -hmm. expect to find like that. It's about sort of human generosity. And, and I just have some really amazing staff across the university who I've happened to sort of bang into through showing up to stuff. And, um, and I'm just really grateful for that support as well. So it's not just about you know, strategizing, I'm going to get to know you so I can get a job. But, but also about being part of a community. Yeah, it's way more fulfilling because whenever you look back, like I remember when I was younger and um, feeling very motivated within the capitalistic system. <laughs> and uh, I remember every time I went into a new opportunity, I'm like, I'm not going to get distracted by people. I'm going to get the job done. I'm here to do work. Um, and of course, inevitably, like when I, when I got into it, it was all about the people. And when I look back on it, it's all about the people. And that's a, that's a really good thing. Um, and eventually I kind of grew up and realized that actually, but it's life's about people, even even in the work environment. So yeah, I, w I didn't mean it just in terms of like strategizing, um, but also in terms of having that community and that support around you and and enjoying that experience because you you do only live once. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, I'm quite similar in some of my circumstances to Vivian that I'm definitely very bound into this place, Otago at the moment. Um, three children. Uh, established um, academic partner so um, and I'm really I did actually do my PhD because I wanted to pursue an academic pathway I've got a primary teaching background as well and had moved into the university setting and kind of wanted to stay there that said I'm not averse to going outside of it um, long term but I think I'm really conscious having put blood sweat and tears into this thesis and this doctoral journey that I want to keep that academic option or that door open um, in the first instance but I'm also very well aware that I'm not going to just walk into a the, the job of my dreams sort of situation and we've talked around this quite a lot but um, I was just wondering if we could just talk a tiny bit more about what sorts of things should should someone like me do to keep that door open as long as possible. I'm fortunate in that we have figured out we can survive on one income <laughs> having had my scholarship run out so we can do that so um, I'm sort of really privileged in that way and appear to be quite creative, I suppose, in terms of um, things that I could do. But I'm aware that, yeah, that I'm, I might have to be quite strategic around. So if people have any kind of other ideas beyond what's been said already, I'd be really interested. Well, for me, I, I want to keep that academic door open as well, long term. Um, I always have. So um, 
because I love those big ideas. And the advice that my husband's always giving me is to just make sure that I keep publishing on the side because um, you're going to get those interpersonal skills and that other work experience, experience in, in those references in your day-to-day -day job or whatever it is you're doing. Um, but what can fall behind um, is your publication record. So if you, if you try to keep up those opportunities to publish um, from your PhD or anything else, then that, that would be really important, I think. Anything else that's really interesting to me, because I mean, I, you know, get, there will be a certain amount that I can get out of my PhD. I've got a little bit out of it already, but then how do you keep on like with a new project or like so that's where you look for small part, or, you know, yeah. Tell, I mean, it's great to know that you're in this position now. <laughs> Your research jobs come up. I know Esther's looking. <laughs> so it's um, tell people you're looking for research work because that what that does is it gives you access to the university library resources. It hopefully gives you access to space, potentially. Yep. It gives you data that you can then publish from for incredibly long times, sometimes in my case, beyond the actual thing. So those little opportunities are really good. So yeah, publish from the PhD, look for other opportunities to do work where you get more work you can publish. And, but also kind of think like an academic, even if you're not in an academic position. So it's research, teaching, and then service. So if you get opportunities to teach as well, grab them. Um, Any teaching opportunities or well, like? I think, I think, I mean, obviously you have to be strategic about where you are in your discipline but for example if stuff came up in the college of education grab it because those things all build that academic kind of profile mm. i mean you're lucky coming from a professional background because you already have that track record um, so yeah the, the publishing is the real biggie but um so yeah but tell people and guest <laughs> lectures and stuff like that and keeping track yes. of it yeah. it's also i think in my experience research cost quite a lot of money um, and the kind of work I did as a PhD student is not the kind of work that I will be able to do independently. Um, but there are other things, depends on the field, especially in the social sciences and humanities, that other projects that could be cheap, kind of more literature based. And then if you have access to the to, to literature, um, and then you could publish some opinion pieces or, or kind of literature based articles rather than uh, empirical ones. And the other thing would be stay connected with societies that are relevant to your field. So, um, because that keeps you connected with the community and keeps you updated with kind of what's going on in your zone. Um, even if you kind of move out of it for a time, you can move back. Um, yeah, that's really helpful. Rebecca, I just wanted to bring you in here on, on that point that Viv's making about. Um, because you know, often the, the academy is sort of seen as the ivory tower and it is very disconnected from the real world and, and all of those sorts of things. And maybe if you can just say something about that question about the, um, the connections between government and university. Yeah, so I was um, just thinking about your question, actually, Esther. Um, I would also advise to keep an eye on what's going on in the government sector. So, like, for example, the Ministry of Education may need bits of research done and that's one thing from government that is really handy is knowing various um uh various people around the traps who are at the stage of their career and saying we really need some work done and if it's under a certain amount of money then we can we can do that relatively quickly um the the i get i guess the um from a wider alumni perspective um the trouble with Otago and central government is you guys are down here and we're all up here. And it's really um, hard to sort of break that a little bit for people to look outside of, if I'm being really frank, Victoria and Massey, because they're there. Um, so I would just keep an eye out because they, they do float around. Um, and again, and I, I'm here to say this again because I don't want to come across as just a network fiend who has no substance, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I do, people, because um, uh, of course you've got to back it up, right? Um, uh, is trying to get to know for, so for your area, and I'm sorry, I'm not, um, I don't know the exact detail, but perhaps the, min the, the Ministry of Education, getting to know people in the particular fields in that ministry um, would, I, I don't know, it might be helpful in your research, but also they'll think of, they'll think of you yeah. and there is there is money floating around for bits and pieces, um, but I can't really speak to the 
that subject in particular, but I know for us at the Ministry of Defence, sometimes we have bits of work that it would be great if someone could just sit down um, and do it. And I know at Foreign Affairs and Trade, we um, paid a student to do um, a couple of bits of research for us and we just didn't have the time to sit and think because we're too busy dealing with OAAs. Um, you know, um, so that's that's really helpful. Um, it was also just another point I sort of wanted to address around some of this idea of we have talked a little bit about um, basically doing the grunt work with a smile on your face kind of thing. Um, and um, I'm going to call a spade a spade here. When you first start up, it really does suck because you do get given, in, in government, you get given things like OAAs and ministerials. So that's writing a letter back to a member of the public who's written a question into a minister. Um, and that is awful. But I think what it is, is um, being able to say to yourself, um, this isn't exactly what I want to do, because trust me, you don't want to do an OIA. Um, this isn't what I want to do, but I'm learning really important bits from it. Um, and also in the knowledge that after you've been there for a little bit, you, you won't have to do those as much anymore. Um, but yeah, because I just didn't want anyone to get the impression that, you know, you come in and it's basically sort of some sort of slave ship where we like <laughs> do this terrible work for years. Um, but, uh, but part of it is learning and although I was being slightly a little, a little flippant earlier with the writing, it is quite a different set of writing. So that's one thing I think um, perhaps when you come out with a PhD, you have learned a very specific style of writing and uh, for government work, it, it doesn't translate. And I think that for some people with PhDs, it can be a little disheartening because you think I've done, I've done all this work. I'm, I'm, I'm actually really clever and you are really clever. Um, but someone's come through to my, my aid memoir and just annihilated it with a pen, you know? Um, don't take it personally. I'm, I'm, I'm being serious because you, sometimes you just, I mean, I do it and I feel terrible to people, but it's just, it's just a little bit different. So I think maybe it's going in with a realization that um, it, it is different and being prepared to to work with that because yeah. I don't want to I don't want to plump up working for government is like the big end of life but um you know if you do choose to go down that route it's something you consciously have to decide because the, the two worlds do there's a Venn the Venn diagram has a little bit in the middle but it, in terms of what you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis is very different so sorry I've gone so far off topic that's not funny but um <laughs> just look for opportunities either I want to add just a quick little point to that, that um, if if you are doing stuff that you don't like, as, um, as Rebecca, Rebecca? Yeah, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> That's terrible. Um, um, as Rebecca said, uh, it's really important to figure out what you're going to get out of it yourself, yeah. but also um, um, be careful and, and make sure that you're going to have that um, managerial support around you and that may take different forms it might be more support from your peers or from a team leader or from upper management but make sure there's some support there for you because if you just worked um, like a dog without that support it can have really bad consequences on your health and and well-being and um, it's not worth it so uh, yeah so there's a balance with it um. are there any comments or questions from the people in the other venues. SK, sorry, I don't have the full name. Selma. Um, Selma, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I think I agree with some of the panel saying that uh, you have to, you know, be prepared to learn new things, meet new people, even if you don't know. This is from my past experience. Even if you don't know, take it, take the job and find a mentor to learn because, you know, you, you never know actually when the skills or knowledge that you have learned will come in handy because I have had my experience working with the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Higher Education, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, and I never thought that I will be in, the, in this different ministry because I started off my career as a teacher and then a lecturer and you know and uh, finally I was in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and I, I never thought that I would be learning this thing but meeting new people be prepared to learn new things actually would you know would come handy to you one day and uh, for example like um, I used to be part of the ISO and the MQA something like the NZQA and then I ever thought that uh, why would I want to learn this thing but 
you know, having been in different ministries, you realize that, oh, I'm, I'm thankful that I've learned that skills elsewhere and I can use it. So, um, you know, just be prepared to learn new skills, meeting people, because like, like uh, what Dr. Vivian said just now, um, uh, you know, uh, don't think of it as a strategy, but more of a support. You never know when you need the support from different people. Yep. Thanks. Thank you so much. Any other questions from the other sites? Sorry, if we do have people on audio only, I'm just not sure if that is the case. <coughs> if there's anybody who wants to say anything or type anything in. So it might be a good idea if you mute your microphone again. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just have a cough coming on. <laughs> just on the. Um, I had. Oh, sorry, there's a question. I had. Uh, well, um, I, I just wanted to say that I really connected with what Navi was saying in terms of having gone through those rejections. And I think that's been. It resonates quite a bit with my experience uh, in terms of CVs getting rejected over and over again. And. Um, also found that the networking bit really works but uh, the question i'm sort of leading up to is in this time where you have periods of lull where there's nothing there's no job op opportunity sort of coming up and you know you've just faced rejections i'm just wondering if you have had in those periods of being down or you know have nothing happening what might have been your personal sort of coping strategies so one thing I did, and I'm probably slightly obsessive compulsive, but I kind of um, just worked. So I, I kept writing like it was a job. So I would, you know, take the kids to school and then sit and work on a paper and then pick them up again and cook tea. You know, so, yeah. yeah, which kind of sounds sad, but um, <laughs> that's what I did. But also, um, I guess uh, other things that were kind of kept me connected to the community in different ways. So... Um, and this little NGO research project is an example of that. So that was actually a government project. It was an RFP request for proposal that this NGO got. And so that kind of connected me in that way. It was barely paid. but um, So I pretended to be an academic, even though I wasn't. I don't know if that works. It's not appealing to everybody. I, 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 I agree with that, but also uh, a common theme uh, that you also heard that you he you heard here, but I also hear it, you know, elsewhere. And and I must admit that I'm part of that group. I financially I can sit at home and not work. Yeah, that's right. Right. And you and it's sad and and sad to me that that's the reality. But a lot of us who manage to hang, you know, to hang on and look for these opportunities, and sometimes uh, don't have employment. A lot. Well, oftentimes we rely on on our significant other to support us. And it's not it's not a good thing, but I mean that's that's uh, that's reality. So I, similar to Vivian, I also did some projects. Uh, I wrote a working paper for a big project in, uh, somewhere in New Zealand. Um, I never got paid for that. I'm not, I'm not sorry for do, to, for doing that. You know, networking and it's you know people have cited it and it's the work that it's out there. It's PBRF eligible, um, but I didn't get paid for that. Um, so kept on going. Thank you. There's a comment here from Massimiliana who um, says, Mike, thank you. I'll read out your comment. I'd just like to say thanks for a great session. It can be quite demoralizing to face the job market after finishing the PhD and knowing that other people have gone through the same thing definitely makes me feel better and motivated. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Massimiliana. Um, any, any final comments or questions for, for the panelists? Or just some There's a comment. Katrina? Katrina? Um, it's just really a comment. I mean, the things that we've talked about probably answer it, but because I've just finished, something that's different about finding a job after a PhD than pretty much any other instance of finding a job is that there's this kind of fixed moment in time. The PhD finishes at a certain time. If you've had a scholarship, it runs out. Mm -hmm. Usually when you're in a job, you can stay in the job that you're in and keep collecting your salary and you can be applying for other things and waiting until you get chosen or the right thing comes up for your next move. But I wasn't kind of prepared for the additional stress it would be 
to be in this time with the sense of the clock ticking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That you know you're going to be finished at a particular time, and then there's nothing. So I mean, I guess all of the strategies of applying broadly and networking and taking the small contracts and being flexible, they're all that we can do. But yeah, it was a unique experience compared to other times when I've applied for jobs and you know the level of stress associated with a rejection compared to when you've got a job that you can carry on going to and you've been rejected from something else it's quite different mm -hmm. and it's just something that I wasn't ready for that I've now experienced mm -hmm. that's true yeah. Yes. Yeah. Karen what was your hand up earlier it was just up and he was pointing to Katrina I guess one <laughs> one comment following on from that and it doesn't kind of fix it because I think you're exactly right it's a really stressful kind of moment especially if you're the one who's the breadwinner um but um that if you want to go down that academic route that kind of precariousness continues actually to a certain extent even in even in permanent positions so-called permanent positions so i think it's mm -hmm. it is really important to recognize that your worth is not tied up in this thing like to try as much as you can to be a whole healthy person and this is just part of my life not everything and my worth does not hang on it so yeah it's good to find other people who are in that position who you can kind of commiserate with and get coffee with and go for walks with and do those lovely things because yeah you just have to kind of look after yourself yeah. can i just add to that i yeah. think it's also relevant just in work in general is um and uh this is uh Oh, I'm going to emote all over the show here. Oh, <laughs> this is, um, it, it's taken me a very long time to do this, but my worth isn't my work. Um, and it's really important to remember that because it's always been my worth. Um, so you're making sure that you have lots of other things because things will happen at work where projects won't work or you will have done this. If in, my, in my case, huge things. And then the minister just says, no. Nah. <laughs> I'm going to make this other decision over here, which is really stupid. Um, instead of just going, which is highly thought out and well reasoned. Um, uh, this is being recorded, isn't it? Whoops. Um, oh, you worked in many ministries, so. <laughs> Ex-ministry. Um, uh, but um, I, I, I think um, it's, I mean, this is, yeah, sorry, I'm being a bit Dr. Phil, but a good thing just to remember just in general, because I personally have, being too wound up in my work, and I love my work. Don't get me wrong, um, but it's a it's a good thing just to keep remembering. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and once you finish the PhD, if you do get an academic job, then you will not get grants. You will not get journal articles published. You will not get promotion. So just you know, this kind of thing continues so, yeah. in different ways. So um, it's a really important kind of life skill. To yeah. On that one. But yeah, I do. The financial aspect is really significant. Yeah. So really acknowledge that. On that cheerful note, <laughs> I, I mean, I really did want to end this panel on a, on a high note, but I think it, it, it has actually um, thrown up a lot of the, the realities of um, finishing PhD studies. It, you know, it used to be that you'd walk into a university job and, and that would be your lifetime career and you'd have these students kneeling at your feet and it would be amazing. And, and of course, in, in the era that we're in now where, where a lot of our work is about finding more money and um, finding research money and getting students in. And we you know that these are the realities of, um, of a university. But also just something um, d d about government work as well. Um, I think it's so much bounded in, up in our identities of, of who we are. And I think what the panelists have said is really quite important to know who you are outside of your job is really critical. Um, for for survival because there there will be things that are um, you know whether it's mean comments on on something that you've given as an advisor to a minister where they've just rejected um, what you've spent hours doing or you know the same thing could be true in academia that um, and we've probably all experienced this of spending a lot of time on an, you know an article or a chapter and your, your supervisor trashes it or or it doesn't get accepted or not even sent out for review. So the, I mean, these are the realities of, um, of these kinds of jobs. And, um, and I think it is, you know, about learning how to, to deal with the rejection, but maintaining that ray of hope. Um, and I really think, you know, what the, what the panelists have shown is that it's, it's not a linear path. Mm. You know, it's, 
it's going to be finding those opportunities, making them when they aren't presented to you, um, and, and being proactive in, in the strategies um, um, and getting to know humans. I mean, I sort of say this quite a lot to, to my first year students who, who seem in some ways to be very anti-human and they, they really just want to you know, email us rather than come and see us. But it's a very different thing when they actually do come and see us in person. And I think those personal relationships, um, as, as many of the panelists have, have suggested, th those are the critical things um, in making those connections to, to first and probably subsequent jobs. So if I can just add to that, I went to a previous um, panel on alternative pathways after the PhD and was run by the careers um, department. And they had a, a panel for people who had all done you know, fantastic things after PhD and hadn't gone into academia. But the repetitive story out of all four of them was how lucky they were. And it was just the only message that came out of it that they were lucky that they did this and they were lucky that they met the person. And so I just wanted to say this is really refreshing because actually you didn't mention luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's not helpful to anybody. And yes, there is an element of luck, but maybe it's not phrased like that. The fact that you've said, you know, network, put yourself out there, you know, be strategic. I think that's really helpful because um, listening to another panel and just hearing about luck, you kind of just want to walk out the door and think, well, if I'm not lucky, I never win the lotto. You know, what's going to happen? So, yeah, so just thank you yeah, very much. Make for your that. own yeah. agency. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks, everyone. I think it's been a very informative session, and, and I've certainly learned a lot from the panelists and also the questions um, in, in the room. Uh, I did just want to end by saying that uh, Karen and Sophie Bond, who's the other coordinator of the um, Early Careers and Postgraduate Network, we are planning to continue the series next year with, with any luck and hope <laughs> <laughs> and agency. <laughs> we will make it work. Um, so if you haven't yet signed up to the uh, Early Careers and Postgrad Network, or possibly some of you aren't actually on... Um, uh, on ESOC side, and you've just sort of heard about this from friends, do sign up. There's some really fantastic networks and sessions and, and things like this. And just to, to and point to some... And it doesn't cost. It doesn't cost. It doesn't cost. cost. Yeah. Yes. A <laughs> weekly newsletter as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I think um, specifically because of the point that Rebecca mentioned about how isolated uh, we can sometimes feel in the South Island, I think it's really important for us to, to have these kinds of opportunities where we have... Um, nationwide interactive sessions without the cost of having to fly up to to the North Island so yeah so with you know with continued participation we can we can keep this going so tell all your friends and do sign up um, and thanks very much to to Karen um, and Sophie in her absence for you know running uh, these these workshops I think it was and and, you too. Well, <laughs> I'll thank myself <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's been a, a, as I say, if you do want to go back and look at some of the recordings of the other sessions we've had, that's also a good idea. Um, and in particular, I'd like to thank all, all the panelists for bringing their, um, their tales of woe and happiness. Um, and yeah, and for, for just giving us some insights into to what it is like, uh, some of the challenges they've faced, but also some of the highlights that they've had um, in their, their somewhat um, convoluted career so so thank you very much to all our panelists and thank you very much to everybody who has joined us from afar um, hope to see you again um in, uh, we will keep you posted if you are part of this network or via the ESOC silos and also just wanted to thank specifically uh melanie and rianne and I wasn't sure if rianne was there today uh Melanie is. Uh, Melanie is, yeah. Melanie's also been working furiously behind the scenes to, to make sure that this network can happen. So thank you very much, Melanie, for, for your work. Yeah.